Um, good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many of you um, on for what is the fifth, I think fifth, if we say Stuart, the fifth um, Sorry, session yeah. on Let's Talk Rules. Um, tonight we're going to talk about um, Rule 11, Player of the Net. Um, uh, again, it's, it's a little bit of a complex uh, rule for what takes up just over a page of the rule book. Um, uh, just a couple of things before I start. Um, uh, last time um, there was a bit of, I understand there was a bit of feedback on um, from my laptop, so I'm now using an external microphone, so hopefully that will uh, sort that out. Um, if you do hear any noise coming through, just drop a note in the chat and we'll see if we can sort that out. Uh, the other thing is um, if you have any issues um, seeing any of the videos, um, that uh, are shown. What I've done for this time is I've done a complete list of all of the source for all of the videos. So um, whether they are from the casebook or from YouTube, um, and that will be available so that you can see which slide, uh, what the video is for each slide, if you uh, can't quite see it properly um, through the uh, through the presentation. And that will be available afterwards, which will be uh, useful. OK, so um, without further ado, um, let's see if we can uh, get going. So uh, the purpose of um, this session is to look at rule 11, which covers player at the net. Um, and within the scope of that rule, um, we have uh, reaching beyond the net, penetration under the net, contact with the net and interfering with play. Um, and as usual, we'll look at the rule text, um, uh, whatever is in the guidelines from the Rules of Game Commission um, and the casebook. And I would say that the casebook that deals with Rule 11 is extensive. There are many cases which deal with it. So I've been relatively subjective in terms of which ones I've picked to um, use for the presentation. So the basis of Rule 11 is to deal with the player at the net and the situations uh, in which that play is both legal and illegal. OK, so the most common situations as a referee that we come across are um, that the player may contact the ball in the opponent's um, space uh, and when that contact is considered to be illegal. Um, where a player may contact the net and when such contact with the net um, is deemed to be interfering with play and when it isn't. And where a player may contact the opponent court and when such contact is deemed legal and illegal. Um, and there are some other um, occasions of interfering with play that we'll get to. Um, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a let's talk rules session without referring to our good friend rule 10.1.2 when we get to that point. Um, I think it's been in about the last three three presentations. So first and second referees need to know the, the rule 11 in detail because it includes a lot of actions that are only considered to be um, in play, so to speak, if the player is in the action of playing the ball. OK, and or they are interfering with the opponent's ability to play the ball. So this, these situations can be quite subjective for the referee. But what you need to know is as long as you understand the rule, you can apply the situation and then you are quite um, easily be able to sell your decision to the players, whichever way you decide. Um, the key thing with some of these decisions is to be decisive and to know which way you're going to go. OK, but we'll come to those points of, of uh, as we go through. So the um, the guidelines uh, regarding Rule 11 um, say that on account of the top quality of the teams participating and the game near the net it is fundamental, is of fundamental importance and therefore referees and line judges must be particularly attentive. And it goes on to say that uh, referees must also be attentive to cases of interference. Um, most of the game takes place pretty close to the net, or the, or the most of the contentious points of the, of the game takes place very close to the net. And therefore, it's, it's 
um, part and parcel of being first and second referee that you have to focus uh, a lot on these areas. And the rules have changed, and we'll come across this later on. The rules have been adapted in terms of the guidelines as well for first and second referees to say that the second referee's responsibilities are now focused so much on the net that as a second referee, you can be in that little zone of about a metre off the net each side. Um, throughout the entire match, and that is your main priority. Okay, substitutions, bench control of that sort of stuff, work with the scorer comes comes in the in the in the downtime. But when the play is in it, it taking place, you are absolutely focused on the net. Uh, so the first part of the rule is reaching beyond the net. Um, so reaching beyond the net has has two two separate elements to it. The first of which is that a blocker may touch the ball beyond the net provided that he she does not interfere with the opponent's play before or during the latter's attack hit. So the guidelines just say simply that if the ball is completely on team A's side of the court and team A are in the process of attacking it, team B's block must not contact the ball until team A have finished the attack hit. OK, but since the um, blocks uh, or attack hits and blocks come in very quick succession the referee has to be very clear as to which of those came first particularly with some of the senior teams where reaching beyond can be quite a considerable distance you can get a good half a meter into the opponent's court um, with the block okay um, so here's a couple of um, uh, examples um, one of the uh, one on the left hand side there of uh, the USA's um, three-man block all of them are reaching beyond um, I'm pretty certain that attack hit had no chance of getting anywhere. Um, and on the um, on the right hand side, we have a clear, a, a classic example of times when as a referee, we need to be decisive as to what we're going to call. Now, in this case, we, we we're not at the plane of the net, so we can't quite see whether the blocker is reaching beyond or whether the blocker is still in her, her own space. And it's the setter that's perhaps partially in the opponent's space or whether um, or whether the setter is, is fine. But looking at the setter's hands, the setter's hands are not in a position to play the ball forward, uh, play the ball over the net. So therefore, in this situation, you've got to be clear as to whether you think that the blocker is interfering um, with the setter's attempt to play the ball here. OK, and this won't be probably the first time, but with the overpass in this kind of situation, this is a clear one where you just need to have your toolkit ready for this situation. So the second part of um, player uh, reaching beyond is after the attack hit, a player is permitted to pass their his or her hand beyond the net, provided that the contact has been made within his or her own playing space. Now, this is where most of your um, reaching beyond the net calls will come from. Uh, and this is where uh, players get too excited, particularly with the overpass um, uh, and trying to attack it um, when the ball has not um, crossed the plane of the net yet. Um, so you, this is one of those times when, again, you have to watch out for this one and be clear as to which way you're going to go. So the guidelines, again, try to be helpful. Um, a, a Team A player spiking the ball that is completely in Team B's space, having been set from Team A's side of the net, is a fault. Um, and, and all they're trying to say there is that once the ball has crossed the plane of the net, any contact with it is clearly going to be in the opponent's space. And one thing that's come into the game recently um, is that um, uh, a lot of uh, middle players are now following um, a ball going close to the net over the net and following it and trying to uh, put a block uh, straight up on the first hit. Um, now, this sometimes... Um, uh, I've seen it at least three or four times in 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 the pre preceding season, um, and and it seems to be one that's come through the international game um, when they've seen it on on sort of television and just seeing what they can get away with. But items that you need to consider in this area are: has the attack hit been completed? Um, is the ball going to cross the plane of the net? Is the blocker allowed to play the ball with a block? Does the position of the ball allow it to be attacked? And does the blocker attack the ball or does the blocker block the ball? 
there is a distinct difference between the action of the blocker um, here. So we have to just remember a block is a rebound. So it should be just simply that the ball hits the block and rebounds off. If the blocker puts any action on the ball, then the blocker is attacking the ball. Now that doesn't mean to say that they can't use forward motion in the block as to reach over and back. But when the ball actually does contact with them, it should be just straight in and down. OK. So let's have a look at um, reaching beyond. OK, so in this case, um, this is a typical example of um, when a ball comes off a block. And the ball off the block goes parallel to the net and that another player um, near the net then either plays it um, either by attempting to block it or in this case they're on the green side. You can see that the ball is clearly in the red space. So therefore the green player is not able to block this ball. It has never, never been an attack hit. And remember an attack hit is any ball that comes across the net from the opponent. So a ball coming off the block into back at you can be an attack hit. In this case, the ball has gone parallel to the net. It never again crossed the plane of the net. So therefore, there was no way that green here should be playing that ball. OK. Uh, Alex, is that a question? Yes, Nick, can a referee interpret that as an attack hit? Or uh, does the rules not allow you that much leeway in interpretation? No, no. In this particular situation, um, uh, this has to be an attack hit because the ball is, you know, if you think of the definition of a block, a definition of a block is a ball coming from the opponent, trying to intercept a ball coming from the opponent by reaching yeah. higher than the <clears> top of the net. Now, in this case, the ball's not coming from the opponent. It's never crossed the plane of the net. So therefore, this cannot be a block. It yeah, has exactly. to be an attack hit. So. It in my reading of the situation, the player attacks the ball that is not completely on the red team side. I think the ball is slightly in the middle. So I don't think that's a fault. OK, let's have a look at it again. If you if you if you look at it, let's see if we can stop it. I would think uh, the part of the ball is in the green team side. OK. Um, but again, that is just subjective. So let's have a look at this one again when we get to the. Nah, I was trying to um, just move it on a bit. No, sorry, I couldn't try. I couldn't stop that one. Um, what I was trying to stop it was is the action of the play, when the player played the ball. Now clearly the player's hand. Part of their hand was certainly in the opponent's space. OK, that ball was not going across the net, so therefore wasn't a was an attack hit, so therefore was not able to be blocked. And that's why I think the referee made the decision that she made. It, let's have a look at a, a, another example. There's, there are there are lots of examples of this, so uh, let's have a look at another example. And this one is perhaps um, I think this one might be slightly clearer because I think this one is Annie Drews uh, by, from the USA. There. OK. So in this instance, we'll see that Annie Drews of the USA number 11 clearly contacts the ball in the opponent's face. OK, um, so in this case, you also take into consideration that there was a player um, underneath the ball. Here she is. Yeah. So this player was in the position to play the ball and to keep the ball alive. OK, for for um, for Turkey, I think it is. Um, so therefore, um, in this instance, Drews had to stay on her in her own space if she was going to play the ball. Now, the ball was not in the USA space. It was in Turkey space. So therefore, this is clearly reaching beyond and, and the fault of playing the ball in the opponent's space. Let's just watch it once more. So this again is, is exactly the same situation. The ball comes off the block and runs parallel to the net. 
yeah, it never crosses the plane of the net again. So therefore, it's not for USA to attack. OK, in that situation. OK, here's another just uh, a different example here. And in this case, OK. So we can see here that Kazakhstan quite, quite clearly believe um, no Kazan, sorry, um, quite clearly believed that um, uh, that this uh, that the first block um, was was uh, illegal. However, if you watch it, you can clearly see that the ball travels forward. And I think this is the point that Goran, the first referee, is trying to say here, is that um, when the ball is um, when that when the ball is first played um, by the by the player close to the net, the number eleven, um, he's reaching for the ball. All that's going to happen is come is to come off him and go forwards, and it does. And all the uh, the blocker um, is doing is covering that play. OK, and in that situation, the ball is not, is, is I don't know why they're complaining. They won the point. <laughs> but um, uh, in, in, in this situation, this was uh, this was a legal block. Um, the ball is coming forward. Now, if that um, if number 11, when they played the ball, had got the ball to come vertically or played it back towards their own court, then the blocker may not touch it. OK, so it's quite clear in this this situation that it's the it's the forward movement on the ball that would say that this was going to become an attack hit and therefore the blocker was able to play it. If the ball in your in the referee's judgment was that the ball was played vertically, perhaps off number 11, then the blocker cannot touch this ball because, again, there has been no attack hit. But I think in this case, um, uh, it's quite clear that there would have been a, that this wasn't a, would have been an attack hit. Because the ball was on its way forward into um, in, into court B. Just there, as you can see, it goes, it's going up and forwards. And, and as I say, there's no reason for them to complain on this situation because um, they actually win the, win the rally as well. OK, so let's move on to penetration and we'll talk about the faults in a minute so don't worry too much about the fact um, that we'll go through the rule and then the the faults of player at the net come later which deal with all of these um penetration under the net so okay it's permitted to penetrate the opponent's space under the net provided this does not interfere with the opponent's play and it goes on to define that by saying penetration into the opponent's court beyond the center line um, and you can do that by to touch the opponent's court with a foot is permitted, provided that some part of the penetrating foot or feet remains either in contact with or directly over the center line. OK, to touch the opponent's court with any part of the body above the feet is permitted, provided it does not interfere with the opponent's play. And this can be quite extreme and we'll see that in a minute. A player may enter the opponent's court after the ball goes out of play. And also players may penetrate into the opponent's free zone, provided they do not interfere with the opponent's play. OK, um, and in this instance, the guidelines are quite clear about it. They say when it, where interference in this situation occurs, the second referee should identify it and whistle it. OK, so this is from um, Canada and this is a little um, uh, a rule um, sequence that they've put together to show the center line and what is legal and what isn't legal. So this is quite a good little um, uh, video. Only lasts a, a couple of minutes. Let's just move it on. OK, so this is clearly. OK, so in this case, the first one. I'm just going to stop it there. Can I ask a question? Um, can you hear any? Um, can you hear the video commentary or not? No, there was no audio on that, Nick. Okay, right. I'll I'll, I'll cover it then. It's no problem. So okay. So what they're saying is that the first time, number five, clearly the player is allowed to land on the centre line. He's not over the centre line. He's landed on it. There's not a problem there. Okay, but it, so this is the second referee that has to watch this. Okay. So you're watching the block and you're watching the center line. OK. Right. OK. 
So now player number nine has contacted the opponent court with their foot and no part of his foot is above the center line. So that is a fault. Okay. So number seven here has crossed and, and touched the opponent court, but part of his foot is still over the center line. So this is fine. And you'll see that the blocker does exactly the same thing. So there's the, there's the blocker doing the same thing. Okay. Now, as second referee, you've got to be able to see all of these plus the net. So you just need to think about how you um, um, pick these up. Um, now they're going to show a situation in a game. Okay. So you saw him retrieve the ball and slide under the net into the opponent's court. Okay, so this situation, whilst the, boat, whilst the player's feet are in the air, the player is on, on their back in the front court. He's not interfering. There is no Australian player near him. Um, we ignore the fact that his feet are in the air over the opponent's court. They are only a fault if they touch the opponent's court. OK, so this is where you get the situation whereby um, it says that a player, uh, player may be um, on or over the centre line, but their feet may be over the opponent's court. As long as they do not touch it, then this is uh, this is still legal. Like I say, so in this passage of play, this is exactly why this rule was changed to allow the position. And we'll see the um, slow motion from the net camera um, coming up. So this is an excellent retrieval by the player who has slid into the opponent's court. OK, he doesn't touch the opponent's court with his feet and immediately. Gets back into his own court. So in this instance, this is a case where the player has in, has penetrated into the opponent's court, but has not interfered with the opponent's play. So this is legal. OK, so let's have a look at an, another situation here. Uh, so this is a, this is a challenge. So the play has already happened. You're waiting for the challenge review. So if you watch the player, the players land, let's try and stop it there. OK, so at this point we can see that number five has um, landed with their foot uh, on, on the opponent's court. But from that particular view of it, um, I would say that there was uh, maybe maybe uh, the odd millimeter or so over the center line or contact in the center line. The key thing on this particular one is the fact that the player who's blocking is going to land on top of him. OK, and because the player lands on top of him, he is interfering with play. OK, and therefore this is a fault. As you can see, the block lands on top of his feet. Just there. Here. And therefore, this is a fault. This is clear situation of interfering with the opponent's play. Nick, we just got a question in the, the chat there from Nicholas who's saying, so a player could literally have their entire body on the other side, including their feet, but it's not a fault as long as their feet don't touch and they're not interfering with play. Correct. And, and there's a video that shows that um, that situation in more de in a better than the, the, the one we saw in, in a minute when I get to the faults. OK, so we can move this on. OK. So um, the rule also says that you are able to um, penetrate the opponent's court once the ball is out of play. OK, now this normally um, happens scenarios where this might happen. Um, you need to be aware of um, attackers that come in to attack the ball, um, maybe through four or, or through the through the middle, um, where they have a significant amount of forward motion. OK, um, and you need to watch how they then um, land and move forward. Now, if they are um, skilled enough and hit the ball hard enough, um, in many cases, they will be expecting the ball to land, be ball in um, before they land. 
So therefore, wherever they land um, is fine because the ball is out of play. Um, this is a this is a very strange situation. This is a, a backcourt attack, as far as I, I remember, um, where the where the player has forgotten to wait until the ball is out of play. So in this situation, um, our player, the, the player from white number 15, is all is only concerned by the fact that he's he's hit the um, defensive player in in the in the face and the ball is ricocheted off into the crowd. Um, in in um, being a, a good sportsman, he's forgotten that this particular match is has a challenge system um, in play, and um, unfortunately, the team in black have just said, "Well, hang on a minute, the ball is not um, out of play yet, and you've entered our court." So therefore, um, whilst Whilst it has no impact on on the, the rally or the outcome of the rally, um, unfortunately, number 15 is at fault because he's in the opponent court. Now, if you consider that um, this is a backcourt attack, this happens quite regularly where the backcourt has got a lot of forward mo movement so that they're trying to contact contact the back, uh, the, the hit somewhere about a metre, just over a metre, metre and a half off of the net. So they have a lot of forward motion. So their aim is to then ground the ball before they land because they know they're going to be very close to the centre line. Um, in this instance, he's able to stop himself before he gets to the centre line, but then uh, unfortunately then decides to be a good sportsman and causes a fault by going under the net. But when you're when you're refereeing, if you see players that you know um, when they attack hit, you can they have a lot of forward momentum. You just need to watch where they then end up, and it's good for the second referee to do this. Um, so the first time it occurs um, to um, to know what to look out for later in the match, because at some point there's going to be some contact. Nick, we've had a couple of questions on this, if it's OK. It's, been, it's causing quite, quite, a, quite a chatter. So the first one um, from Nacho, can interference occur when the foot is not completely over the centre line? Correct. Yeah, so, so in, interference could occur when... Um, in, in, in any in any way where you can uh, where you're impeding the the opponent, uh, I think I've got we've got a video later on which shows a block landing on top of the attack hit, um, and this is a clear situation where there is interference, um, but there but there is actually no fault um, committed in terms of penetrating the opponent court. So so absolutely, if the block is if the block lands on top of the attacker, then the attacker is interfering with the block. OK, and therefore it's a fault against the attacker. And it, it, it's one of those ones where sometimes you'll get blockers trying to con, trying to con uh, the situation by saying, oh, come on, ref, he, he's hitting me every time he attacks. Yeah, you just have to, as a second referee, be aware of the situation and look for any contact. And, and if that contact is interfering with play, clearly, obviously, landing on top of somebody else is interfering with play. Most likely it's going to... Um, it could be a, 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 a sprained ankle or a broken ankle um, and you just hope that that doesn't occur. So that must must be um, a fault um, every time. And this is why penetrating the opponent court with a foot on the ground is um, a fault in every single occasion it occurs. Whereas if the feet are in the air, it's not a fault. And, the simple, and, the, and that's quite a difficult one to understand, but the simple reason is that at the top of the men, top level volleyball, some of these players are earning considerable amounts of money and the clubs have invested hundreds of thousands of euros or US dollars in them. Um, the last thing they want is uh, an opposition setter or an attacker to step under the net, penetrate their court on top of their player's ankle, break their ankle and have them out for the season. And that's why this has to be classed as a fault regardless at every time. So on that point of landing on a player, Nick, or, or landing on their foot, um, Clive has asked, so what if a player lands on another player's foot <laughs> with both players' feet halfway over the centre line? OK, so it, it's the... Um, <laughs> uh, normally, it will be the player, that, the player that's first is the one that's interfering. OK, so the player that's landed first will be the one that interferes. So, so in, in this case... 
if you've got an attacker and a blocker, it's pretty much almost certainly going to be the attacker that lands first. I, I, I in most 90 percent of the cases anyway, and therefore it will be the attacker that is causing the interference, not the blocker. Because the blocker is the blocker is going vertically up and down. And the blocker's got no real um, uh, case to be in the in the opponent's court. Normally, with blockers, the, the when they um, penetrate the opponent's court, it's because they they land and then they turn. And as they turn on the ball of their foot, their heel, which was legal over the center line, suddenly becomes wholly in the opponent's court. And that's the point at which a blocker might um, become a uh, faulty penetration of the opponent court. The other one that is um, uh, to watch is the setter penetrating um, or, or in other cases, it doesn't have to always be penetrating, but a setter running towards the center line, waiting for the pass. Um, and the pass is then um, maybe maybe too short and is going to come near the three meter line. So the setter then puts their foot out to stop their forward motion and then steps back to try and recover the ball. And it's quite often in these cases that they will put their foot backwards behind them. If they're close to the center line, quite often they will just step straight into the opponent court. Now, if there is a front row player stood there, then the setter is going to put all of their weight on top of their foot um, to push off. And, and if there's a, unfortunately a front row player there, that front row player can sustain um, some considerable injury um, from doing that. And that is one of the reasons why but, um, people say that penetrating the, the foot into the opponent court is is not a, is nobody sees this fault. It's only the second referee that sees this. Nobody's interested or they certainly would be interested if their player has just uh, broken their ankle. And that's why we have to have to uh, be strict on it. We don't uh, need to see the rest of that video because. Uh, it's the same one. Let's see if we can move on. Uh, come on. Move on. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, we'll, we we will come back to this because we've got um, when we get to 11.4, we talk about the faults of the player at the net. So we'll probably end up talking about some of these situations again. OK, contact with the net. So contact with the net by a player between the antennae during the action of playing the ball is a fault. OK, the action of the player in the ball includes, among, among others, the takeoff, the hit or attempt to hit and landing safely, ready for a new action. And the key point here is ready for a new action. OK, so if the player has landed safely, but is still out off balance or still has forward momentum, then they are not ready for a new action. OK, so at the same time, players may touch the post ropes or any other object outside the antennae, including the net itself, provided it does not interfere with play. Contact with the net outside the um, antennae um, is not interfering with play. You will find uh, we'll, let, we'll talk about that in a second. When the ball is, uh, let's just cover this last one, when the ball is driven into the net, causing it to touch an opponent, no fault is committed. So this is basically saying that obviously you have to be aware that when the ball is um, uh, played into the net and the net then contacts the uh, the blocker, then it's not a fault against the blocker and you need to recognise those situations. So it could be the net band or it could be the mesh of the net. Um, it's just the forward momentum of the ball which has caused the net and you'll know that because the net will deform. So as a second referee, you'll see the net deform and you'll see whether the it's the ball pushing the net into the block or whether the block has got a forward action against the net. OK, so if the block is in the same vertical plane when they're jumping up and down uh, and the net comes to them, then it must be the ball that's that's contacted it and therefore cannot be a fault. If the if the blocker has got a forward motion and they contact the net, then it will be the blocker that's the fault. OK, and it's just one of those ones that you just you just know you you watching it enough, you'll get the instinctiveness that that what, what is the fault and what isn't. OK, so just just consider the action of playing the ball at the net um, and the um, secure landing. OK, so the action of playing the ball is the action of any players who are close to the ball who are trying to play it, even if they do not make contact with it. 
The fact they do not make contact with it does not mean they are not in the action of playing the ball. Um, so this can include fake attack um, and the referee should pay attention that um, if a player is in his or her playing position on his or her court and a ball is driven from the opposing side into the net and causes the net to touch the player, no fault is committed. The player may apply a movement defending his or her body but has no right to, to do an active motion towards the ball or deliberately change the path of the rebounding ball. The latter situation is considered a faulty net touch. So this last part of this situation is uh, interfering with play, okay, and comes under rule 11.4 as interfering with play. Um, so what we're saying about the, the, the players acting of playing the ball is that the players must be making some effort to play the ball. Whether they actually play the ball or not is irrelevant. If they're making an action of trying to play the ball, they are in the act of playing the ball. Um, but in all of these situations, contact with the net by a player's hair is not a fault. In um, The only case it would be is if a ponytail got completely tied up in the net, but you'd be stopping the rally anyway um, to deal with that. So um, and any contact with the, with the net by hair is... Um, not a fault. And in general, um, if if the ball hits a player's hair and goes out, it is not ball touched. OK, if it hits the player's head, it's ball touched. If it hits the player's hair, it's not. And and this is but that, now this doesn't mean that if I've got if I've got a good head of hair and the ball hits me on the top of my head because it's hit my hair, um, that's not a that's not a touch. It is a touch. What I'm, we're talking about is where, for, for example, a player may have lots of hair and the ball skims and it just hits the hair um, or a ponytail. Um, that's not a touch. Um, but if it hits solid part of the, uh, the, the head, then that is a touch. But let's just have a quick look at this is a very quick um, uh, video showing uh, the setter here um, contacting the net with her ponytail. OK. So so in these days of challenge, um, the, the the opponent team is, uh, in women's volleyball, that they, they know when the ball, when the net shimmers, it's most likely not a net contact because it will have been something like a ponytail or something that's done it. Um, and therefore, they have to be careful that they don't try and challenge the situation where the player's hair has touched the net because they'll obviously lose their challenge. Um, this is what we were saying about um, net con uh, being um, not a fault if you hit the external part of the net, the posts, the ropes, the cord, the net itself outside the side bands. So anywhere in the blue area here is not a fault, OK, um, unless it affects the structural integrity of the net um, or the net touch is deliberate. Um, so the net, when they when they say the structural integrity of the net is, they really mean that the net is abs is is damaged, okay? Uh, the cord's been broken or something like that, okay? But they don't mean the fact that just because somebody's landed and hit the cords, the net is shaking, um, and the opponent team will then go, oh, hang on, Ned, it must be interfering with play because I've stopped playing because the net's shaking. Uh, that's not a good excuse, and um, players know that they play to the whistle. OK, and in this situation, just because the net is bouncing around does not mean that there was an illegal net contact. Um, you'll see it in this uh, particular example um, that the net moves an awful lot, but this is this is a legal contact. OK. Because he so he puts his hand, he put whilst he puts his hand out because he knows he's going to contact the net. Um, he he lands completely outside um, the antenna, and therefore this this is legal. Okay, there's no there is no problem with that. And as a second referee, you just need to be aware of of the uh, of the contact which is outside the antenna, particularly close to you. It's it's really difficult to see whether a player is. Um, inside at the antenna or outside the antenna on the first referee's side. 
as a second referee. So in those situations, you really need the first referee to give you some help to tell you where it, where the blocker has, has actually contacted the net. OK, now if the contact is with the antenna, the antenna is mi middle of the player, then then that's a net contact. If the contact, the, the, the antenna is um, to the side of the player, then it's more than likely that they were outside. But sometimes you may, as first and second referees, need to just have that quick conversation as to whether the contact would have been inside or outside the antenna. OK, so players' faults of the net. OK, so a player touches the ball or the opponent in the opponent's space before, during or, uh, or the opponent's attack hit. OK, so the signal, we all know the signal. The signal is reaching beyond. OK, number number 20. Um, either way, it, uh, either way it goes, it's a first referee signal. OK, or um, although as second referees, you may may wish to try and to, to help your first referee. But obviously, in this instance, you cannot insist on the call. OK. Um, right. So. An example. OK, this is a clear example of reaching beyond playing the ball in the opponent's space before an attack hit. OK, um, the setter number three has got no chance to set that ball before the block has touched it. So therefore, in this case, even though the setter, I think, is front court, um, this is clearly a case of um, reaching beyond the net. OK, and uh, was called as such. Just watch it once more. OK, she's going up there and there's no way that number four should be blocking that ball. It's if, if, if number three wasn't wasn't playing the ball, the ball would have hit the net band and would have still fallen on the side uh, on court B. So therefore, in this situation, um, there was there was no need for the blocker to be attempting to play the ball. And unfortunately, the blocker here has contact with the ball. Um, and um, therefore, this is a fault uh, to Germany. I think it's Germany. Um, one thing that would um, situation would be here is if number three had played the ball and the blocker had not touched her or the ball, then you would have allowed play to continue. Okay. Uh, this is a situation for Bulgaria. Um, um, as you can see, um, what we'll see what happens here. This is uh, against uh, the USA. OK. So so in this instance, again, we can quite clearly see that um, it's the same as the first two situations. The ball um, came off the block, did not cross the vertical plane of the net again. Therefore, Yossif, Yossif Bob, um, in this instance, um, uh, had no right to play the ball. OK, so um, in this instance, um, Anderson Casador, our referee, uh, first referee, is very clear, very quick um, that this is reaching beyond. OK, and the rest of the Bulgarian team and the coach would be pretty disappointed in this situation because they were probably going to win the point. Um, there was a USA player diving under the ball, so therefore the USA could, would have had a chance at recovery, but it wouldn't have been a good ball. So um, in this instance, it was a little bit of um, exuberance here from, from, the, from the captain 12 um, to play the ball. There was no need for him to play, and he's lost the rally because of it. Let's just watch it again. OK. So we can see in this situation that there was uh, there was no. Um, the, the ball didn't ever come back into um, Bulgarian space, so therefore um, number 12 was not able to play that ball. OK, and there was a, a USA player diving underneath. Okay, so move on. OK, another situation. So Brazil and Italy this time. OK, so in, in this case, um, 
we talked earlier about the fact that a player after the attack hit is able to pass their hand into the opponent's space as long as they don't um, interfere with the opponent's play. So in this case, um, Wallace has contacted the hand of um, number five and drawn that hand into the net. OK, so um, this situation on, on um, I think, on challenge was overturned. OK, so the fault has been committed by the attacker by by contacting the, the blocker's hand and bringing the blocker's hand into the net. OK, so in this instance, um, the attacker is at fault, not the blocker. Now, this is quite difficult for the referees to see this. Um, A, because the first referee will be following the path of the ball and, and B, the second um, the second referee will have seen that uh, number five was reaching beyond the net um, and therefore it wasn't it wouldn't have been immediately clear that it was the attacker that had contacted. So in this situation, it's most likely that the referees at the match would have said that this was a net contact by Italy. And without challenge, it's very difficult for them to have uh, made any other decision on it. Unless the two players, had, had the player number 12 and, and number um, five, had actually between them said, look, hang on a minute. Yeah, it was you. OK, it's my fault. Etc. And in that instance, whilst we don't like um, taking the player's word for it, because <laughs> if it was um, if it was 14, 14 or match point or something, they're certainly not going to help you out then. So um, but at other times you may have to use some of the um, some of the information that you're getting from the players to help you. This is a difficult situation to see. So in this situation, um, in, in actual fact, um, uh, Andre, um, ha, uh, the first referee, has decided that this is the attacker that's contacted the net anyway, because um, he's immediately um, shown it as a net contact. Now, whether he knows that it was the, um, uh, the, the Italian that's caused that or not, I don't know, but, but he gave it correct. OK, players faults of the net. So 11.4.2 and 4.3 are similar. OK, so um, 4.2, a player interferes with the opponent's play while penetrating into the opponent's space under the net. Um, and 4.3, a player's foot penetrates completely into the opponent's court. OK, so what do we mean by this? Well, when the penetration into the opponent court beyond the centre line is with a foot, i.e. the foot hits the floor in the opponent's court, to be legal, part of it should remain in contact with the centre line or above it. OK, now second referees, of, of, this is a real, this is the, what we talked about earlier. This is really, really um, uh, important that you understand both parts of this rule. OK, um, that is what is the definition and what is the fault? A contact with the opponent's court with the foot with no part on or over the centre line is a fault every single time regardless. I've mentioned it previously about the fact that it's about player safety. OK, however, a foot in the opponent's space or indeed the whole body in the opponent's space is legal, except where except where it interferes with their play. So what do we mean by this? OK, so this is a, this is a simple situation of um, players interfering or the attacker interfering with the blocker. OK, so the, uh, the 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 blocker, the Italian player ha has been knocked over, and the reason he's knocked over, as they will see, and in this instance they've got a challenge system. So Fabrice, um, the French referee, has asked for the challenge, and he will now see quite clearly what uh, what happened here. As you can see, in this instance, the Australian player is legal according to the wording of the rule. However, he interferes with the blocker's play because the blocker lands on him. OK, and therefore the attacker is at fault. Watch it again. Yeah, OK, and, and the second referee is very quick on this situation as well. So we can move this on.
OK, now this is um, a similar situ situation there. Now, the actual fault is not the player on the floor here, but you can see what the, the, the point is, what is legal. OK, so whilst whilst this was a four um, four touches. This player that's on the floor here is legal. OK, there is no interference with the opponent's play. The player is completely in the opponent's space under the net, but they are not interfering and therefore that is legal as long as they don't touch the floor with their foot on getting getting themselves back into play. Let's watch it again. So if that ball had gone uh, up and over the net, then that would have been uh, carry on play. The play is legal. OK, now this is not quite so good a situation. This is um, Philippines versus Vietnam, and this is an instance whereby um, interference has occurred. OK. Right, so what we've got here is we've got both referees have decided that um, it is the, um, uh, the the player on court B who has fallen into the net. And that this is a net net fault, OK? Um, they haven't considered the fact as to why um, she fell into the net, OK? And if we watch it a bit longer, we can see the reason why she fell into the net. So if we stop it there, we can see that that um, the the player from the uh, from white has um, slid under the net. Okay, so if um, she 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 is legal um, as much as as long as she doesn't interfere with play, um, but the ball has gone straight up uh, 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 above her, and the uh, the blocker um, was going to attempt to block and cover that ball. But then she suddenly realizes that the player is right underneath where she's going to land. And therefore she pulls out of the attempted block and in so doing she falls over the player and into the net. So it's been a little bit harsh um, on the player in yellow. Uh, we might see it from the other side. OK, so this is the uh, this is the camera uh, from the net camera and you can see that the player is underneath. Player number three is not looking at her at all. OK, he goes up to cover the ball over the net and suddenly realises the player is underneath her. So, so we can disagree with the, um, <laughs> there, there isn't a, cent there is a centre line fault. Um, Um, in this instance, um, and that is interfering with play. The referees have not considered that. OK, so in this instance, number three has been interfered with in playing this ball, so she cannot be um, uh, the one that has caused the fault. Let's move on. Yeah, one comment there, Nick, from, from Clive, if that's OK, just jump in. Um, yeah. Tyler said, if a player goes into the opponent's court, that might prevent the opponent from even running an attack. Uh, does that make it difficult to judge? Um, it, it can do. And, and quite often you'll get players with their arms out pointing at players lying in their front court. Um, you, have to, um, you have to judge whether that player is actually stopping oh. them playing the ball or not. Um, so the fact that they are there doesn't and, and the player might be slightly distracted by them doesn't automatically mean that they are interfering with play. So if they are absolutely in the way of, an, of, of say, a player's um, run to get an uh, attack or to recover the ball, then um, then they would be interfering, but not automatically so. So you've got to be you've got to judge it as to um, as to as to which one one it is. 
and in most cases um it is the, the the player is not interfering rather than interfering okay now most teams will tell you that um you know as they will with net contacts that every net contact and every player in the front zone is all is all automatically um, interfering with their play because they've seen them and therefore they've been distracted um you 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 need to um you need to make a judgment at the time and decide whichever way um i don't think either team will worry whichever way you go okay but it's not automatically interfering and the whole point of this rule is because players were diving in, in the front zone to recover the ball and keep a rally going and and sliding slightly into the opponent's court um under the old rule when it was the hand and the foot over the center line and and they were sliding slightly into the opponent's court and immediately being picked up for, for penetration. And, and that's why the rule was changed. The rule was changed to allow players to be able to recover these balls in the front zone to keep the rallies going without the fear of, um, uh, of where, they, where they ended up after, they had, um, uh, after their dive or, or whatever had, had finished. Okay. okay, and this is a, this is a, a good instance from Poland of um, of the same thing. Now I'm going to move this on because it's got two rallies in it, and I don't think we want the first rally. I want the second rally. Let's go from here. Okay, to watch the player at the top. Okay, so in this instance, if you remember um, from uh, earlier, um, let's talk rules. We've talked about a player. Um, may stop um, one of his um, teammates from committing a fault. OK, so in this instance, um, the, the, the player in black has, um, has, de has decided to help his player who's strewn across the front zone of the white court um, by dragging him back into the correct, the correct court. Um, I, I, you'll notice from the replay, which we get to in a second, that he doesn't contact the opponent court whilst doing so. Let's just move it on a bit. So they're going to give it ball in. OK, and so. OK, so you can see here that whilst the player is completely in the opponent's front, front zone, um, his feet are over the center line. So therefore there is no fault. Now, if his feet, uh, I think the heel of his foot there is actually on the court, but because it's over the center line, um, shadowing the center line, it's, it's not a fault. Um, if he was going to go further, then all he has to do is keep his feet in the air. And then his, um, his colleague can still drag him back into, um, into the right court. So in this case, very quick actions by the, um, by by the, the the players and and as you can see the the front row here they haven't even noticed him yeah they're not it they're, they're not afterwards they point and start saying yeah hang on but but here they're watching the ball which is what which is what they should be doing okay so then comes, uh, then comes the wording on interfering with place. This is 11.4.4, and this is where you get um, your net contact um, uh, rule uh, fault from. So a player interferes play with play by touching the net between the antenna or the antenna itself during his or her action of playing the ball. Using the net between the antenna as a support or stabilizing aid, um, or creating an unfair advantage over the opponent by touching the net, or making actions which hinder an opponent's legitimate attempt to play the ball, or catching, holding onto the net. Uh, any player close to the ball as it is played who is trying to play it is considered to be in the action of playing the ball, even if no contact is made with it. And by it, they mean the ball. OK, uh, however, touching the net outside the antenna is not considered uh, a fault. OK, uh, which we which we've covered. So second, so this is um, penetration and, and net contact from the from the second referee. OK, so 
as a second referee, and the problem here is I didn't have a photograph which was at the right angle. So you, you just have to bear with me on this one. As a second referee, your process is up and down. So, so, the first, so, so when you're looking at a play and a block, um, you start with, with, the, with the on the way up. So is the block going to contact the bottom of the net on the way up? Do they hit the net plane, they, they hit the side of the net on the way up? Then when they are blocking, do they touch the net band either at the beginning, during or on the way down from the block? And then you make a decision. Do you see the player contact the ball or not? Because you need you need that information as well. Do they then contact the plane of the net on the way down? So have they got forward motion or have they lost balance? Do they contact the net bottom of the net? And then finally, is there any interference or do they cross the centre line? And, and it's a process of up, bottom, side, top, side, bottom, floor. And you do that each time. And the key thing is, is to make sure that you stay with the net through the whole process. Don't get distracted by something else, because if you do, then you'll most likely miss some of the things like the center line or interference if you move your eyes away too quickly. So it's about keeping your focus on the net. And that's why the um, Rules of Game Commission and the Referee Commission have changed the rules around um, first and second referees and the net so that the first referee follows the ball and the second referee focuses absolutely on the net. OK, so. This is just reiterating the net contact fault. So during the action of playing the ball, attempting to play the ball or faking a play on the ball, all of them are the action of playing the ball. OK, the only situations whereby they are not in the action of playing the ball is if the net is contacted by a player at two and the ball is actually attacked by a player at four. There is no connection between those two players. OK, so therefore, even though the player at two might be faking an attack, if they contact the net, it's not a net contact because the ball is. Is the other side of the court. OK, Sim similarly. If you're um, if you've got a center uh, middle player. Um, and you um, and the setter is next to the middle player and the middle player will sometimes do a fake a fake attack next to the setter and the setter is going to push the ball out to four anyway. But if that middle player contacts the net whilst the ball is still with the setter, then that player is in the action of playing the ball. They're close enough. So don't try and don't try and be overthink the action of playing the ball. OK. And just consider that when the player's action stops, OK, it doesn't stop until they've completely regained their control and their balance ready for the next play. So a blocker that's landed until they are absolutely stable and they're turning for their next action, they are still in the action of blocking because they could still lean forward and touch that net because they're not correct in balance. So you have to stay there and just make sure the player is stable. Right, they are right. The play has finished. The action has finished. Now we can move on to the next phase of play. Uh, OK, so um, this is a this is a video that was um, sent was done about, um, I suppose, um, eight years or so ago. It's been updated um, for the for um, the, the net contacts and what is um, uh, the net rule application. Um, so it's always worth just spending just a couple of minutes just um, going through these. It was a very quick, um, you know most of them. So attacker, yep, attack hit, follow through, contact the net. It's a fault, yep. OK, in this instance, exactly the same thing. Um, the attacker has wiped their hand down the, 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 the plane of the net. OK, in the attack hit. So that again is clearly a fault. And so this is a difficult one for the second referee because it's over the far side of the court. OK, 
Um, and you have to judge whether that player is inside or outside the antenna. OK, in this case. The players outside the antenna, number six. Yeah. OK, so this is not not a not a fault. OK, so. The, the cases with the block. This is a, a clear one. As you can see, the player's got forward motion as she la um, she lands and brushes the net as they come down. OK, so you can see that when a player is reaching for the ball and isn't, isn't stable before they jump for the block, you might see that they have this action. OK, and in this instance, you can see number 14 has moved and she's just going to start to jump when she realizes her hands are under the net and she takes the net with her as she goes up. OK, now she's not in the, in the right position, but she's still interfering with play. OK, similarly, this is a blocker that's come all the way down, and this is the one that sometimes if you if you get distracted away from the net, you'll miss. And this is with the hands coming down last and just catching the bottom of the net and the net bounces all over the place and everybody's looking at each other going, who touched that? OK, so this is one where the second referee needs to needs to be very clear. Uh, and these ones are generally easy for the first referee um, to pick up. And that is the, the setter either touching the hold of the net or touching the top band with their arm um, when they're trying to um, trying to uh, play the ball in this instance. So again, bottom and bottom and uh, and and side. Okay, so just just be aware of uh, of those. Okay. OK, so number six should be ashamed of himself. OK, um, so quite clearly here, he knows that it's going to be very close to the net. The attack, the attacker's arm. Let's go back to that one just slightly. He knows that the attacker's arm is going to be very close to the net. And as you can see, his hand here has touched the net. Now, this is intentionally um, this is intentional. Now, if this is seen by you as a referee, then this leads to sanctions. OK, this is the instance where the ball is driven into the net. Now, the, the player um, may not intentionally move towards that ball. They can they can defend themselves in their own sh shape, but they cannot move their arms. OK, so here they're allowed to do this, defend themselves. But what they cannot do is move towards the ball. If they move towards the ball, they will change the ball's rebound out of the net. OK, and that is a fault. OK, and this is a, obviously a common one of a player trying to uh, keep the ball alive and, and hitting the net from underneath. So OK, so this is two players together. Um, off balance, trying to cover the cover the attack hit uh, and clearly um, number one is pushed into the net by number six or whatever that number is. Um, and in this case, the player is, is is now saving themselves from falling over by holding on to the net. OK, so similarly similarly these are play these are actions of players not playing the ball but they are the in the action of playing the ball they don't contact it so just watch um uh, is it larson yeah so the outside hitter um here okay so she stops so so larson here stops because she knows the middle players coming across there's nothing that she can do about it. The middle player lands on her and pushes her into the net. It's a net. It's a net fault. She doesn't contact the ball, but because the two players are together, they are in the action of playing the ball. Okay.
So you can see in that situation that two two players go to attack the ball, and because the player is there, it gets knocked into the net. So they both get in each other's way. This is a clear net contact, even though he's not contacted the ball at all. Nick, there's just a comment from um, or a question from Clive at that point. Yep. I'm sure it's related to this video. And Clive has asked, can you explain again why setter setting to four and touching the net is not a fault, but was a fault in the later video example? Um, I, so, OK, so, so I think what I said was that um, if um, if you have a player who is, if you have two attacks, the setter say, is it, say it's a set at three. Um, the setter have got two options. They're going to set either behind them or in, fr in front of them. Um, and both players go to attack. OK, now, if the player, if the player that um, gets set the ball. Uh, sorry, which way did we go? Yeah, so the, so the player that doesn't get set the ball um, and if they do a fake attack and it hits the net, then because the ball's the other side of the court. Yeah. They, they they cannot be in the action of playing the ball, even though what they're trying to do is to encourage the uh, to say split split the block or get the block to be um, uh, to move. OK, so because they because the ball is nowhere near them, it's the other side of the court. They are not in the action of playing the ball. But if they but if they are very close to the setter when they do that and the ball is then pushed out, say they say the, the the player that's doing the fake attack is next to the setter. And the setter then pushes the ball to four, and and the and the middle touches the net. Then that would be, because they are next to the setter at the moment the setter has got the ball. Okay, so they are in the action of playing the ball. But if they are, you know, three meters away, four meters away, five meters away, they cannot be. So it, it's a it's a it's a it's a tricky one to um to 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 um e explain. But if 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 the ball is one side of the court and the player that touches the net is the other side of the court, then that player that touches the net cannot be in the action of playing the ball. But if but if at, at the point at which, um, say, uh, the, a fake attack um, commits a block and the fake attack touches the net and they're, they're close to the setter at that point, they are in the action of playing the ball, even though the ball does not come to them. It's it, it's it's a it's a tricky one to um, to explain. Uh, without a, a decent video that will show it, um, I might have to get a team to um, to to act it out for me so that I can show you a video of it. Yeah, so so uh, as you say, the setter is playing the ball. Yeah, so because the setter is playing the ball and the fake attack is right next to the setter, might be just be behind them. Okay, then the fake attack is in the same action of playing the ball. That's what we're trying to trying to say. Clive, if it helps, but you're more than welcome to um to unmute and 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 ask away yeah. if that helps. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. Yeah. Is the setter setter can't be exempt from a um, net fault? Surely, no, no, he's no, setting the ball in goes into the net. He's it's a net fault, is it? Absolutely. Yeah, so the setter isn't exempt because the throughout the throughout the action of setting the ball, they're in the action of playing the ball. Yeah. So so before before and after that contact, they are in the action. Once they've landed and the ball has gone the other side of the court or whatever, then then they are no longer in the action. But as they at that point of of of, uh, of setting, yes, absolutely. And what the point I was trying to make is that if a player an attacker is next to the setter when the setter is in the action of playing the ball. So is the attacker. Right. I think I think the one that threw me was right further at the start where you were saying the setter, I guess, is at two, setting out to four and um, net touch. And that wasn't a fault. I couldn't understand that. OK, so maybe I, maybe I wasn't clear enough then. So, yeah, ab absolutely. If the set if the setter touches the net, Whilst they're whilst they're in the action of, of setting the ball, then that would be a fault regard. Yeah. Okay. yeah. OK, great. So, so even though even though at the point at which they might touch the net, the ball might already be at four because they're still in the in that action of, of, of having set the ball and landing and recovering their position ready to play the next action. Only, oh, are you saying if, the, if they've released the ball? Yeah. And maybe they lightly brush the net, you would ignore that. 
no, no, no. If, if, yeah. if they're still in the in the action of setting, yeah, i.e., they haven't landed or they haven't regained control, right. and they squash the net in that, then they are still at fault. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Cheers, bye. So um, I, I talked about the division of work um, and to allow the um, the two referees to be collaborative here. So so this is why the rules of game now say that the first referee should concentrate on primarily on the path of the ball um, and the second referee will focus on the net um, and its entire length and all the play at the net um, more. Um, and, and the reason um, the reason that is, is because um, at the top of the game, we're we're now moving away from four line judges and things like this. So we've, you've got two line judges. They may or may not be paying attention in the National League, as you all well know. Um, so as first referee, you may be having to call ball in out quite regularly based on your own, judge, on your own judgment. If you're trying to look at the play uh, around the net to its, to its conclusion, you will not be in a position to see the ball in or out. So therefore, um, the division of uh, responsibility is now that the first referee should follow the ball so that they can make those judgments and the second referee will deal with the net. And that's why the second referee's focus has got to be pretty much on that sort of meter either side of the net and your movement around the, the post. Now, there may be occasions when the, um, the first referee sees a net contact which is close to them on their side of the court, it's right in front of them. Um, and therefore, if they do that and it's at the top of the net, fine. First referee are not stopping you calling it, your, but your priority should be on 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 the ball, okay. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I say second referees must stay with the play for until it has reached its logical conclusion. Just watch what happens. You're looking at this player here. Okay, so that's quite extreme. Um, but um, she contacts the net with her foot while she's in the action of playing the ball. Now, she's not in the action of blocking or, or anything, and the ball is going uh, away from the net, but they're still in that, that action around the net of recovering a ball which has been attacked. And in recovering the ball being attacked, she's allowed herself to overbalance and her foot has kicked the net. Now, if as a second referee, you'd already moved your eyesight away from that situation, all you'll get then is you'll get the net moving and you won't know what's happened. Um, and I'm sure that um, in this instance, I think it's, um, is it Italy? Italy might, um, might not know what's happened either. All they can see is the net's moving and they know it wasn't them. So therefore it must have been, it must have been Peru. Um, but Peru may not even be aware of why the net's moving either. So in this instance, the second referee has got to have this um, stay with this particular play until it has um, reached its logical conclusion. And I know from personal experience uh, about this, I did a match between Kenya and um, Belgium uh, in uh, summer of 2019. And um, after one play, um, the net bounced a, a lot. Um, and I knew it. I was Kenya were blocking and I knew it wasn't Kenya that had touched it because there was no way they could have touched it. Um, so from a second referee's perspective, there was nothing for me to call, but everybody knew the net had been contacted. It was only when we looked at the um, challenge replay that we saw that Belgium had kicked the net when she landed from her attack hit. How she how she managed to get a foot quite so high on that, I have no idea, but she did it. Um, so, so in those situations, there are some situations whereby you know, well, OK, the net's moving around. I didn't see what it, what it was um, and I'm not sure. So you can't you can't call it, but something has happened. Um, and, in, and in those instances, sometimes you may have a situation whereby you have to say to both both teams, look, neither of us saw it. We don't know what happened. And it might be that the teams don't know what happened either. OK, but it but it's uh, it's it's a it's a case to try and stick as long as you can with the net. It's quite a long way after the play is finished. Now, you can see actual fact he's just turned his head. 
just before the just before the foot contact with the net, the second referee moves his head that way, just very slightly. And the question is, is whether he saw that or not. Now, in this instance, he's lucky because he's got challenge anyway to to, to bail him out. But uh, we we won't, we don't, and therefore um, we have to try and work out what's going on. Um, this is another um, example of this. Now, in this instance, just have a look at what's going on here. OK, we've got a joust and the joust, the ball has gone out. So um, it, it is um, it's point to Italy. But let's um, just watch the play again. And I'll try and stop it at the right moment. Uh. OK. So in this instance. Murphy. Here now you can't see it because of because the, the, the camera is not obviously not on the net plane, but there is a situation here where she could have been. Um, pen, uh, been uh, penetrating the opponent court. So as a second referee here, the second referee is quite close to the post and, and that situation from where the second referee was is not going to be seen. So you do need to make sure that you have got enough view to see it. Now, in this instance, Italy won the point anyway, so they're not going to challenge this. Um, but if they had lost the point, then I'm pretty certain they would have challenged it. And that's easy, an easy way of you could be distracted by what what's happening around the around the net. OK, so creating an unfair advantage. OK, so this is the this is moving in the net, moving your arm. OK, to um, to to change the uh, the way the ball rebounds out of the net. OK, so we've got a video to show what that is. Um, and then we're going to look at um, the other part of interference, which is um, making actions which hinder an opponent's legitimate attempt to play the ball. And this is where we meet our old friend uh, rule 10.1.2 again, which is that you can retrieve the ball from the opponent's free zone and that the opponent may not hinder such action. OK, oh, and um, just so that uh, Rita asked the question on this last week, what's the referee signal? There isn't one for interference. OK, you just have to explain what's going on. OK, so this is the case of the player moving their hands to change the ball rebounding out of the net. OK, it's quite clear. Number 15 would have recovered that ball if it had been allowed to hit the net and drop out. Um, but number 10 changed that by making sure that the ball hit their arms as a hard surface and bounced over 15. So in this instance, um, number 10 is interfering with play. And you can see that is because he didn't have to cover it. He, there was no reason for him to be there. He didn't have to be there. So in this instance, um, it, Lesson learned, I would have thought. Um, now, these are other situations which um, are around um, the net contact that are difficult situations for referees to see. OK, now in this first one, um, number six from I think it's Macedonia, again, ought to be ashamed of himself. Um, OK, so Hungary have been. Um, if you look at the score as well. So so in this case. Um, Macedonia number six has waited for the um, waited for the, the block um, in this situation. And just as the block is about he's played the ball, he's just tagged the net. OK, and it's very difficult to see this stuff. OK, which is why the referees have gone with um, uh, uh, that the net was contacted by the block because you're watching and it's most obvious that why well, in most cases it, it's bound to be the block. OK. Um, this is not a great situation.
Now, given given the state of play, um, I think it was 13 all, wasn't it, in the fifth set, something like that. Um, in this instance, um, the, the point should have gone against Macedonia and number six probably should have received a, a red card for rude conduct. OK, now, if the referees had seen it, um, then then potentially um, Macedonia would have lost the set based on that play. And they should have done. Unfortunately, in this particular match, Macedonia won the match 16-14 on 16-14 in this set. So this point, which was what within five points of the end, was very, very important. And that's why um, not, not, a, not great for, for, for number six. OK, so when the play is close to the net, it's not. So you can see in this instance that when both players have got, come down. Now, in most cases, the, the referees initially, I think, have gone with Japan net contact. But the net contact is clearly with the Italian player here. OK, and, uh, and she will profess her innocence, of course, um, as I say. You just have to um, use your judgment and try and um, try and get it right. Unfortunately, in these situations, they're very close. And I think in these situations, when the ball is so close to the net, as first referee, you've got to really at this point, it's it's possibly one of the points where you go, well, do you know what? I'm not. I'm I'm going to hope that the ball doesn't. Where where I know where the ball goes, but I just need to make sure I've I've watched this to the end of of the play because I know that something is going to happen here. Um, but the, the problem is, is, uh, you know, you, you get distracted by this situation and then then you miss something else that's going on. So uh, it's it's just one of those difficult ones that, you know, you just hope you don't get too many of them. So, so in this one, this is uh, so Poland so, so, are quite clear when number three plays the ball, just watch his hand. <laughs> so, so. So I think that previous one with the hand, I don't think that was intentional. I think that was just um, something that happened. Um, this situation, um, clearly, if, if, if you've got one player trying to drag another one under the net, then obviously you've got some form of interference going on. So um, you have to make a decision as to which, um, what the issue here is um, and whether it's, um, so by, by trying to exaggerate um, number, the, the white player under the net, the, the black player has, has, has stopped that player from, um, recovering their position and therefore it, it's a clear case of interference. I don't think it was cheating. I think they just were just trying to prove something. Uh, let's go on. Don't want to watch the beach. Somebody trying to move the um, move the uh, the line. Can't move on. Right, here we go. Okay. Okay, on this one, when you see the close up, you'll see that this is taking this is taking using the net as a stabilizing aid. Okay, so so because they were outside the antenna. That that's that's fine. They're allowed to touch the net, but they were using the net to support them whilst they played the ball, and therefore Sandro was quite uh, quite correct in in saying that that was a fault by the by the attacking player.
uh, that situation was just a bit of luck, actually. Um, the block has obviously clearly gone out, but the player um, in her own free zone um, was in the way and therefore it contacted her before it hit the ground. So therefore it's ball touched. Um, and I think that's that for that one. Let's move on. Nick, we're just going to hand up there from Nacho. Um, yep. Nacho, I didn't know if you wanted to jump in there if you had a question or a comment. Unless you put up Pakistan. Um, um, yeah, yeah. It's a question about... Uh, since we are talking about cheating, uh, although this is probably a question for another uh, session, but um, is something done or can something be done with these players that cheat, but they are not caught in the in, in the match during the match, but it's recorded and everyone sees it afterwards. So can they be sanctioned somehow? Yeah, I think in this situation with Macedonia, I think that it caused quite a bit of a... Um, uh, 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 an issue um, for them, and I think the federation was um, was sanctioned by CEV um, in this particular case, and 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 clearly um, uh, the uh, the reputation of the player number six is um, is not very high, um, and and I, I believe that, that CEV would have taken uh, action against um, Macedonia. Certainly, I would imagine that um, Hungary would have sent the video. Um, straight to the CV, um, but um, I, as I recall, um, the video was online um, with this being pointed out almost almost the same the same night as this situation occurred. So um, so yeah, they they would, they, but it would have to be after the fact. Um, uh, it, it's not great to see. So yeah, absolutely. But something something should 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 be done. And yeah, I do apologise for saying that uh, we shouldn't look at beach clips, Greg. Um, <laughs> Just one follow up there, Nick from from Lud. Yep. Here's a famous incident. I think it might be in the World Championships where the Brazilian coach rolled the ball onto the court. Yep. Deliberately in the middle of a rally. I think it might be match point for his team. Yes. And I think he was sanctioned by being banned from uh, coaching the next match. Uh, yeah, I think he. I think he was sanctioned by a couple of games, actually. Um, yeah, he. he um, for those that don't know the situation, we've, and I will try and find the video for when we talk about misconduct. But um, uh, the Brazilian coach picked up a ball which was being rolled to a ball retriever, um, and instead of throwing it out of play, kept it under his arm whilst the, whilst the next rally took place. Um, at, towards the end of the rally, it was clear that Brazil were going to lose the rally, so at that point, he decided to throw it into play. Um, to uh, to try and get uh, the 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 rally uh, stopped and, and a, a let played or a replay played um, and the, it was caught um, his actions were caught by the net camera underneath the first referee um, and therefore um, he was um, he was banned um, and I think the the Brazilian um, uh, team were also fined heavily for that situation. Um, it wasn't a great world championship for fines because um, Argentina did it. Argentina did a similar thing with, I think the coach um, ran around the court uh, making rude gestures to Poland after they'd beaten Poland um, at the same world championships. But um, uh, this is the situation whereby you're allowed to retrieve the ball from your opponent's free zone and the opponent's team must not um, impede that action. This is the famous case with Nikola Grivic. OK, so we can um, so we know that the, the ball has gone um, over or outside the antenna. Um, and uh, the number 11 from Germany is chasing it. Um, and therefore, he's just about to play the ball when it's caught by the coach. So in this instance, the coach has just got to get out of the way. OK, they, they've got to do their best to get out of the way. So a coach can't just stand there and get in the way. Um, so that ball landed on Grivich. It could have landed behind him. But in those instances, he has to just move to get out of the way. 
Uh, Herman, did you have a comment? Can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, thank you for showing this video again, because uh, what is important is that the ball passed behind the antenna. Uh, I had a situation in a London League uh, Premier Division where the ball went through the antenna and uh, the setter thought that he could go and retrieve the ball from the uh, opponent's uh, free zone. And when I called the ball, the setter couldn't understand why. So what is important, and, and, and this went uh, uh, to a complaint and uh, uh, it was uh, an email sent to Charlie saying that, that, that I was wrong for calling that when the ball had passed through the crossing space, which is different to yep. when the ball is uh, is uh, crossing behind the antenna. Yeah, absolutely. In this in this instance, as long as you're clear that the ball has gone over or outside the antenna, it may be played back. If it's gone inside the antenna, it becomes out as soon as the player touches the ball um, in the opponent's free zone. Um, and you're quite right, Herman, in that situation. Alex. Nick, is it a factor to consider whether the player can reason? Is it reasonable for the player to reach the ball? Uh, um, it, 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 that's a very good question, and let me show you the next clip. Okay, so I throw it to you then, Alex. In this situation. OK, you, you, so let's see if we can see it again. So in this situation, Wojciech has, uh, has, has called the ball as interference. OK, by the player in orange, whilst the, whilst the other player is attempting to play the ball. So let's just watch it again. OK, now. The question is, do, do you think that she could have got there anyway? Um, possibly. It's not clear whether she would have got there anyway. The key point for the rule is that the player number three would have been fine if she'd stayed on her court. So she can move to the um, to the side, but she, if she stays in her court, then she cannot be interfering with a player in the free zone. OK. So let's just watch it again. Uh, OK, so if she stays where she is now, she would have been fine. But there's no there's no reason for her to go into the free zone because she's not going to play the ball because the ball is going out. So therefore, from the orange player's perspective, there is no point in following the ball. OK, all she can do is get in the way. And that is what has been called here interference. OK, um, you could argue all day long as to whether you think the ball would get played back or not. Um, but the point being is that she wasn't given the opportunity because the other player was in the way. So you don't really know. So that's um, so in this instance, you would say that, yeah, that player would have got possibly got there if that player number three had not been there. The fact is that when you watch her, she actually doesn't look at number three. Um, but that, that's not what the rule talks about. The rule says that the player may not um, deliberately interfere with the uh, player's attempt to play the ball. OK, and by doing that action, she kind of did. Um, there is a better one that shows a situation when that is not the case. I oh, know it's not. Um, uh, OK. All right, let's. Um, Let's let's consider consider this one um, then. Uh, Mark, I'll come to you in a second. OK, now. OK, tricky one, this one. Um, the referees allowed the play to go on. A um, couple of things. Um, did the player coming under the net did she penetrate into the opponent's court? Because clearly she had a foot on it. So it's a question as to whether she was on or over the centre line when while she was doing that. Um, 
there's a question about did the ball actually go over or outside the um, antenna? Um, now both players, um, so so the the, um, the 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 Japanese side um, played the ball because they weren't sure that it was going to go out, and quite clearly um, uh, the let's just watch it again. So quite clearly, Argentina believed that the ball was um, able to be retrieved because it had gone over the antenna. So in this instance, both players believed that they were legitimate in playing the ball. And therefore, the, the referees were not in a position to be able to make a judgment either way. So they've allowed play to continue. And I think that in, in this instance, Joe He, as first referee, has, has made the right decision because she's got nothing there to tell her that that um, stopping, why why is she going to stop the play? She's got nothing telling her what fault has been committed. OK, I think, um, I'm not sure what competition this was as to where the line judges are. They could, um, there's, there's one, there's one there at four, I can't see whether there's any, other, any others. Uh, they've got four line judges. Clearly, the line judges didn't make any um, any give any support here at all. So quite rightly, if the line judges weren't sure and they believed that the ball was over or outside, they wouldn't signal anyway. So therefore, in this instance, both both players thought they were in the right to play the ball, um, and therefore play continues. Uh, uh, Mark, I think you might be first. Um, yeah, going back to the first one where the coach caught the ball. What's yep. the call? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK, good, because I'm not very good with these. Um, no, yeah, so that's... going back to the first video yep. where the coach ca caught the ball. Yeah. What's the what's the referee's call? Interfering with play. The coach interfered with yeah. the with the player attempting to retrieve the ball from the opponent's free zone. Yeah. It, yeah. OK, so the, the couch, the coach is counted the same as the player. OK, Ab absolutely. Yep. And so were players on the bench. So, yeah, they, yeah. so so if they stepped off the bench and caught the ball, then they would be stepping into the free zone to do so. And therefore they would be interfering with play. But again, you've got to make a judgment. If if the if the um, German player had had no chance to play the ball, it was sort of like five yards in front of them. Then then you would have gone, well, you, you weren't going to get there anyway. Um, so in that instance, you might have changed your mind. But because both, both he got there at the same time the coach caught the ball, the coach is clearly interfering. There is no signal for that, so uh, you just have to signal it and then explain yourself. OK, thanks. Rita. This um, shades of this Japanese match that we've just been watching reflects. Do we differentiate if it's whether it's deliberate or accidental if the defending team, for want of a better phrase, interferes? Because Newcastle, one well, I'm thinking in particular is Newcastle staffs, one of their setters is very good at going between the post and the court and retrieving balls. And I've had an occasion where the opposition has genuinely thought that ball's coming over and had lined up basically to hit it very much like this goal, but they were actually almost at the net at, yeah. at the time. But the ball went outside the antenna and the staff setter obviously promptly ran into the guy who was there thinking he was going to hit it because the guy had been lining up to hit it. So, you know, he wasn't deliberately standing in the way of the thing. And it was, you know, I would consider it to be an accidental interference. Yeah. We differentiate between what's a, an accident or a, a deliberate, as it were. Yeah, I think I think you can. I, I think you're right. You, you would make a judgment as to whether you thought that was accidental or not. And therefore you decide whether whether you would want to, in that instance, replay or whether you felt um, that because because effectively both players have interfered with each other to be quite honest with you without <laughs> no, it doesn't sound very good but the 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 the, um, uh, the the player is trying to retrieve the ball because they believe it's gone over or outside the antenna the attacker is uh, thinking well in actual fact I'm going to just attack that ball and and finish the the point so both of them are watching the ball thinking that they both have the same right to play the ball so in that instance you just have to see. You know, you might you might come to the conclusion that, you know, I might want to replay that point or you're if you're happy with how it came, how it played out, then you might let it go. But um, you just have to probably take it on its merits, I think, on that one. Similarly, in the same situation as this Japan Argentina here, um, 
you know, the, the referee has said, well, I've got no information to prove to me that a fault has been committed by either player. So therefore, let's just play go on um, and, and see how it develops. And, and then, you know, so, so because there's a couple of phases afterwards, the, the rally's finished under its own steam sort of thing. So it's not really one for the referee to consider that action again. I suppose if the rally finishes at the point two players collide, then you've got to make a decision. And might imagine in most situations, you might say, OK, I, I think there was it, it might be a replay um, or, or you make your decision. I, no, I think the ball was inside the crossing space and therefore you had no right to, to follow it. Therefore, it's a point against you or something like that. Yeah, this is Newcastle staffs we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing goes without being commented on. Oh, uh, OK. <laughs> So I think in this situation, I think um, play play continues and it um, it reaches its um, its conclusion. So uh, in that case, I think both referees did very well. Um, okay, and this is a situation whereby the player stays in their court, and this is the difference between the situation with yeah the ball goes outside crossing space the estonia player number 11 stays in their court and therefore they don't they cannot interfere with 15 because they're in their court 15 has no right to play a ball which is which is which is in the opponent's court they can only play the ball in the opponent's free zone so the fact that they, that, they, that they needed to use the space above the opponent court in order to play the ball correctly, and that play space was already taken by an Estonian de defensive player, then in this instance, um, the, the Estonian player was in their rights to stand where they were. Um, and, and therefore, um, the uh, uh, Portuguese player cannot claim interference here. And quite rightly, the first referee whistled as soon as the ball came back. I think he was a little bit late, but he, he, was a, he came back inside the crossing space. As soon as he realised that, he whistled. So in this instance, um, the Portuguese player was not impeded by number 11 because he was still in his own court. Uh, I think that was the last, the last one, yeah. Um, the reason, um, so the, the reason I haven't got any um, any casebook examples, we've we've been going through most of the casebook examples um, as we've come through this whole section. Um, the key thing with play play at the net is um, that you just need to focus on what might be the problems you're going to encounter um, when you're um, when the ball is close to the net, um, and what might be the outcomes, and have a a, a strategy for dealing with them. Um, Happy to take um, questions. Yes, Ludo. I've been watching some volleyball, I think, uh, and there's been situations where a back quartet of setters jumped up to uh, try and set the ball. And the block has gone up and blocked the ball at the same time. And the back quartet has been blocked for or been called up for a legal block rather than the set for the block have been called up for interference. Yeah, absolutely. So this is this is one where um, one of those situations whereby you 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 think about the situation. So um, most most backcourt setters will when they're trying to collect a maybe this is maybe an overpass situation. That's right. Yeah. Um, so just because they are um, they are jumping with their hands above the top of the net, okay, just because they are not in a position to. Um, uh, they they don't seem to be intending to block. There's no intention in the rules. So because they're in that position of having their hands above the top of the net, if they contact the ball coming from the opponent, then they are blocking, regardless of whether they're looking in the right direction or not. So in this case, if the um, uh, block has got there first and touched the ball first, then the setter is an illegal backcourt block. Um, that that is it. If the if both players get there together, then then you might make the you've got to then make a decision as to whether the setter is um, is 
playing the ball in the blocker's space or whether the blocker is playing the ball in the setter's space. Or it's right above the plane of the net. Or it's right above the plane of the net and one is interfering with the other. That's the point at which you have to make a choice. And whichever way you go, you go, you go with it with certainty and everyone will believe you. But make sure that whichever way you decide, not calling is the, the players will be expecting a fault. So not calling something is probably not an option for you. You either call the setter is, you know, they might complain, but at the end of the day, they, they, they haven't got a video camera. They're not going to be able to go and see it. So you say, no, no, I'm sorry. You played the ball in the opponent's space. All they've got to do is have their hand in the opponent's space when the ball contacts it for them to be playing, reaching beyond. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Another question from Rob. Rob Scott, you want to yeah. uh, ask away? Yeah. Oh, hello. Um, Nick, there's a question, the classic I sprained ankle problem. Yeah. If a player has their foot on the ground, will inside their own court, i.e. four or six inches, their side of the centre line, and a player subsequently, because their foot is, yeah, yeah their heel is on the line, but their foot comes down on top of the other player and they fall over and sprain their ankle. Surely that's not interference by the defending player. So, so the player that's on the ground first, you're saying is inside their own court? Yes. And then they're landed on by a player who is legal because they, they've got some part of their foot on or over the centre line. Yes. But because they've landed on the other player, they will be interfering with the player that's already already grounded. So the player that's second is going to be the one that's interfering. Because, okay. the, play, because the player that's got their foot on the ground can't move their foot now because they've got six, um, 10, 14 stone attacker on, on, their, on their ankle. So, so they're, they're impeded. Um, both players could be seriously injured, which is one reason why you're, why as referees we're watching close to the net play and any player that we see does that regularly then then you need to as referees we we should be having a, having a a, a a word talking to the coach and saying look this player is, is 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 dangerous and you need to they need to either jump further away from the net or they need to change the way they do it or something because at some point they're either going to seriously injure themselves or seriously injure someone else and that's when you see players um, like you see players that that um, when they come to attack, um, instead of making a firm a firm base to jump, which is normally a, a kind of almost vertical jump, they're almost running into a jump. That means that when they land, they're going to have lots of forward momentum. And in those situations, you you can only see that the the situation will be that the block is going to get hit at some stage, and therefore. As soon as you see it first time, you, you know, it's a case of, you know, I, I would I'd call the captain and the player and say, look, you know, I don't want to see I don't want to see you doing this because somebody's going to get really, really injured. And if you do it again, then I'll I'll penalise you for it. Um, how, how would you penalise them? I just say they're interfering with the opponent's play. Okay. Just 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 say, look, I think, that, you know, if you think if you think they're being reckless, then you can you can take other actions you could sanction them if you if you think that they're doing it on purpose and, and say well look no you're supposed to play in your own court in your own space the whole game is around sharing um and your your play is clearly um to either intimidate the block by the block not wanting to get anywhere near you because you know if they think they're going to get injured they won't go there then, then you're creating an unfair advantage, and therefore, as a referee, you need to be able to recognise these situations and deal with them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, not not saying there's a, a right or wrong way to do it. I'm just saying that it's something that you might have to, <laughs> to to think about how you how you deal with it. A quiet word sometimes is 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 often enough, but you know, if it doesn't, then you might have to. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Nicholas. Sorry, I'll get to you in a minute, Mark. Uh, hi. Um, uh, when it comes to, to blocking, I believe that it's legal to do so as long as the ball is traveling towards your court. Um, and, yeah. you know, like, is, but how, however, you, you seem to mention that it's important to know whether if it's on the first and on the second touch. 
where the, the a third touch would have been possible, right? That's 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 what you're looking for. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so if if the block comes in between after the second hit, and then it's blocked, you have to decide whether there was going to be another attack hit because not always it's not always the case that there'll be in a that there could be a third a third contact um if there's a player close enough that could have made an attack hit and the block then gets gets to the ball before them then you have a decision to to make as to well you know that sounds to me as though that's reaching beyond the net and the, uh, and and that's a fault of playing the ball in the opponent's space and therefore in those situations all you're looking for is you're looking to see whether the whether you believe the attack hit has um, has been completed, the block in those situations, the block can't make the second contact an attack hit by reaching into the opponent's space further than the last attacker. They can't engineer that situation, so you've got to just just take a view on it. So, so I had a case where uh, a middle blocker blocked a ball that that was close enough to the net to be blocked, but that would never actually reach the the other side, clearly it was falling on the on the attacker side, um, and, and before the third touch, we see. The question is, um, uh, nobody was was able to play it or would have played it, but it was still technically uh, uh, an attack, so it was legal to block it, right? Yes, ab absolutely. I think in that situation, you make the you make the the, the view. If you called the middle blocker for um, playing the ball in the opponent's space illegally. Then you're causing yourself a situation that perhaps isn't there. So therefore, in that instance, you might go, okay, that's a. I'll, I'll just take that as a block. The ball in, we'll carry on because most of the players would have just assumed, well, no, none of us are going to get to that ball. It's been blocked. Let's let's carry on. They, now, one or two of them might ask you for um, reaching beyond the net, cool. But in, in that instance, you can just quite easily just shake your head and say, no, none of you guys were going to play it. It's been blocked le legally. It was going to be an attack hit, and therefore, let's just carry on. Thanks. Uh, Mark. Mark, you should be able to, if you can't find it, the unmute button's right at the top, just next to oh, the... Sorry, I'm sorry, I thought I had done that. Okay, so going back to the point where an you know, a hitter that's with a lot of forward motion and they're putting their their foot, they're penetrating under the net. But say, for instance, they're legal, they're not going right over the line. But it's sort of you were saying you might want to take the decision to sanction them. I can understand you speak to the uh, the captain and say, look, it's dangerous play. But how you sort of said, well, you might want to do something about it. But what? How would you sank? What? What? How would you sanction someone? For, de uh, you know, for, for for sort of basically being dangerous, like you know, if they they repeatedly put their foot over the you know on the line and it was coming close to the blocker's feet but didn't actually touch them, but you know there was a de what's the you know what 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 sanction could you apply? Yeah, so so in these instances, what what you normally try and see is that the the attacker is trying to get the ball to to ground a ball in uh, before they land. Because they then they can land wherever they like. Because the rules say that you can enter the opponent's court after the ball is out of play. So in those instances, what what you're looking at is you're looking to see whether the attacker is, um, you know, if if it's a if it's a one-off um, situation, then fine. Otherwise, you could you could uh, call them for penetration under the under the net and say no. I'm, I'm afraid that the ball wasn't down before you penetrated the opponent court. Um, or you, you take a, a, a firmer view. If you think that they are being um, are being reckless, you can just have have a word with them and say, "Look, I don't want to see this this happen," um, and um, and and just and just you know, it's just one of those things to be to be aware of. Now, I don't think that there are many players in the national league that I'm aware of um, that do this that that I've ever seen do it. One or two oh, in in twenty years that I've been refereeing national league. I've only seen one or two views, but it's a situation that you just need to be aware of because the block the blocker is quite vulnerable in these situations. Um, I, I think it's one of those ones whereby you could you could easily say, look, um, you're penetrating the opponent court or interfering with the opponent's play, and therefore I'm going to pe penalise you each time. Um, 
you could you could do it that way or um as i say a quiet word to, to get them to dissuade them to do it but um I, i'm not i'm not suggesting that if you think if you think they're being they're being deliberately reckless to endanger another player then then you then you only have one option really haven't you to you, you can you can say to the um to the captain you know you can explain yourself as to what your situation is you know the, the player is dangerous you don't want to see them injure anyone and um you will do you will do whatever you need to do to protect the the other players on the court um i didn't want to make a big a big thing of it but that's you know the, what what i would yeah but so but there isn't really unless someone actually unless they actually touch someone step on their foot there isn't really a, there isn't a sanction that applies to it then um, well, if, if their foot's legal you know so they're not you know going right over the line uh, yeah there, there isn't a, there, unless unless there was something that, that something specific like penetration the other the other way you could just say to the captain is look you know there there is a, there is the rule uh, i think it's 24.3.2 which 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 is called the golden rule, and that is that the first referee is allowed to decide on anything which is not covered in the rules. Oh yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can so you can pull that one out of the hat and use that one if you like. Twenty four point three point two is a good rule. I can tell you, it's one it's one that you uh, one that you can use on uh, on to to get you out of any situation if you need it. Okay, so it's just <laughs> the way you were talking about. It, I I thought there might you were suggesting there was a sanction that could be applied and i couldn't think of one that's oh, fine that's great yeah, I'm, I'm just saying you've got a duty of care uh, and that's what i'm saying that's just yeah yeah i'm with you thank you okay okay um sorry that's been quite um quite a long session uh, thank you all for staying um, staying with it um and um as I say, the um, the recording will be uh, will be available and the video list, so that you, if you want to look at these in um, these videos in in um, uh, at your at your leisure, uh, the video list will be available as well with them. Um, I think there are only two which I can't give you a link to because they're they're videos that aren't uploaded anywhere, which I'll try and find a way of doing. Um, and if you've got any questions after the fact, then just drop me in there and note as per normal. That'll be fine. And uh, I hope that you found it of, um, of, of some benefit.